Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2019 summer school, but I think many of you have been here during the week, so let me proceed to introduce our lecturer for the next two hours. Uh, Dr. Laura Pereira is South African. Uh, she did her original undergraduate degree at Wits University, but from there, she moved on to, she won a number of scholarships and awards, too many to mention, but let me just say, uh, uh, say I mean, I, it took me quite a bit of time to, to, to try and shorten <laughs> her introduction, so I won't mention the number of awards and postdoctoral research and projects that she worked on. But basically, her graduate studies, that is her master's and PhD, she completed at Oxford. And I think if I'm trying to summarize the area of her research, because she did, uh, she studied courses which, which I think her area, her research area intersects, it's a field that intersects in the area where I think nature, society, environment, and the law. Um, in particular, her PhD, for example, focused on how climate change impacts on the sustainability of our food system. After her PhD, she worked as a researcher at the Center for Complex Systems in Transitions at Stellenbosch University. You can explain to the audience what that involves. Um, Laura has also done research in, South, in a number of other countries South, besides South Africa, Brazil, Colombia, Mozambique, Nigeria, Kenya, and she is passionate about allowing the diversity of developing country stories to be heard. She's also very keen on exploring alternative methods in sustainability research. Currently, she is based at the Center for Food Policy, City University of London, where she's working on a Welcome Trust funded project. Let us give her a welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Yeah? Great. Um, well, good afternoon. It's lovely to be here. I was uh, quite, quite excited when I got the invitation to come and talk at the, uh, at the summer school lectures that UCT gives. I know they're always sort of really exciting. And it's a great opportunity um, as a lecturer who's, who's normally um, pitching to, to masters, graduate students, and undergrads to have to come up with a whole lecture that doesn't require uh, two, two months worth of uh, organization and background. So please bear with me um, as, as we go through this. I do quite enjoy uh, interactive, um, uh, an interactive style of lecturing. So if you have any questions or something's unclear, please do just, just ask me as we go through. Um, just a general sense, who's going to be here for, for both of the lectures? Um, OK. Cool. So generally, um, sort of most people, and hopefully for the second lecture, I'll also be able to give a little bit of background because they do feed off each other. Um, so this first lecture is going to be quite a bit of, of numbers. It's really sort of the state of research on South Africans' food system. And it's going to be a little bit more about um, methods and process and innovation in, in the second lecture. Um, there are going to be some numbers, some, some links. I'm sure that we'll be able to pass on the actual presentation to you afterwards. So don't worry too much about frantically um, writing things down. I will make those available to, um, to the organizers so that you can, you can get all of the necessary web links and things, things like that. Um, so as, as mentioned, my name's Laura. I'm currently based in London. Um, I did do a postdoc here under the bioeconomy chair a couple of years ago with Rachel Weinberg. So I'm familiar with UCT, um, but originally from Joburg. So it's nice to, be, nice to be back in the Western Cape. Very good excuse for, for a holiday by the beach. But yesterday's weather it was a bit of a sort of uh, an unsettling uh, setback. <laughs> um, so 
I'm going to start um, with a general outline for, for the lecture over the next hour or so. Um, just starting with this idea of what is a food system, what do we actually mean by, by food system, and then to delve into um, South Africa's food system. And this is going to be based largely on a, uh, a research paper that I put together for WWF and the Southern African Food Lab back in 2014, which was trying to summarize kind of the state of the knowledge um, on the South African food system. And it's going to focus in particular on what we call the nutrition transition, this idea of the financialization of the food system and, and de agrarianization as people are moving off farms, um, urbanization trends and the role of supermarkets within that. Um, and then some of the food security strategies that people are starting to um, employ in order to be able to access food. Then I'm going to um, conclude with some environmental factors, that's the background that I come from, and then just show some of the work that we've been doing around the future of the South African food system and, and some trends to be watching for. And then I'm going to conclude with what I really like is a, um, a video that they did on transformative food scenarios and the Southern African Food Lab. So hopefully we'll have, have time for that. So what is a food system? Has anyone encountered this kind of notion before? No, not really? OK. So this is one example, <laughs> if you were to really talk about a food system that takes on everything. Um, one of my old professors, uh, John Ingram, used to call this a horrendogram. Um, it's when you're trying to get absolutely everything that you possibly could around a system in there. I mean, you, you could start tracing through, and you can see that you've got some sort of terrestrial systems in the middle, you've got policies and governance across the top, some geography on the left, the sun and climate and you know, all sorts of things going on. But this is not a particularly helpful diagram necessarily, um, though you could probably find your place within it. Um, so why do we use a food systems approach? Well, when we think of a food system, what we want to try and condense it down into is this notion of a set of activities and outcomes sort of through the commodity chain of production all the way through to the point of consumption. So that's what we mean by a food system. We're starting from inputs right onto the farm, through processing, retail, et cetera, straight through to what we land up eating at the end of the day, and then even the waste after that. So it's about a very circular notion. Um, and I come from a background um, that talks about social ecological systems. Sorry, that's the social. Um, which, this is where we get into a bit of academies, um, talks about how the social and natural systems have actually co-evolved, that they're not separate from each other, that we're, as humans, highly reliant on the environment. And food is one of those very important aspects that talks to both environmental concerns, but also social and cultural economic, that you can't really separate the two. Um, and sort of, they're also, it's highly uncertain. It can be quite unpredictable. We can't sort of say tomorrow necessarily what food prices, for example, are going to be. They might be a shock event. Um, and much more difficult when we're talking about in 50, 100 years times. If we just look how, how we consumed food has changed from um, sort of three generations ago, you can see how there's, it's very difficult to talk about pre predictability within a system. Then there's this other important aspect of sort of cross-scale and multi-level dynamics. And I'm going to go to, um, to a slide just to explain what I mean by that, because it's a bit of a, a precise definition. So what I think is a bit more of a useful diagram around, around the food system is talking about the set of food system activities. So everything from producing food, processing and packaging it, distributing it, and consuming it. And then the outcomes that we actually expect from the food system. So these outcomes can be food security, which talks about people's ability um, to, to access food, the availability of the food, and then the, the utilization, so the nutritional content, for example, of the food. But then there are also other kinds of outcomes. So there's social welfare. We get jobs, income, employment, trade. There's also environmental welfare. So we sort of need to rely on, on ecosystems um, and the different stocks and flows, uh, marine fisheries, for example, there's an environmental component to it too. And then if you want to take an even bigger step back, we can talk about how sort of this food system on the right-hand side can be linked to a series of socioeconomic drivers, so changes in economics or cultural context, uh, context or science and technology innovation, sort of these impacts the food system and, sort of, uh, and, the, and change it and feed back. And similarly, there are what we call global environmental change drivers. That's what we mean by GEC. And that can be changes in climate, changes in water availability, changes in nutrient content. 
And those, those drivers interact together to sort of change the food, food system and feedback. And so it's quite a, a complex and complicated process. Um, but at least this diagram helps us to understand the systemic aspects of, of the food system without having to go into every single component like we had in that horrendogram. So this is kind of the idea of why we think of using a food systems approach. Um, as I mentioned, this idea of being sort of cross-scale and multi-level, um, it's kind of technical language that we use in, in geography. And it's just to differentiate when I mean by scale, I talk about a temporal scale or a spatial scale, so a um, more jurisdictional scale. But when I talk about level, that's sort of at the very local level or at the national level or at the global level. So that's within a spatial scale, within a temporal scale, you can have um, sort of seconds, years, decades, those are the different levels. So all of these things kind of uh, interact with each other when we're talking about the food system. So global trade processes will have an impact on prices in your local supermarket, for example. So that's kind of a, a cross cross-level, uh, multi-level impact. So these are also things that we need to be concerning ourselves with when we're talking about the food system at large. I mentioned that food security, this is probably a term that people are a lot more familiar with in food systems. Um, the, the definition by the Food and Agricultural Organization is that food security exists when all people at all times, so there's sort of a temporal component there, have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and their food preferences for an active and healthy life. So there are a lot of components to, to that statement, and it's kind of been broken, broken into this idea of being stable over time, that you can't be food secure sort of now, but in two weeks' time, you're not going to, be, um, not going to have access to food. That's not being food secure because it's unstable. Um, you need to have food that's available, you need to be producing enough, you need to be accessible, people need to be able to both go to a store and buy it or, or grow it themselves um, or be able to afford it. And there's a utilization component, as I mentioned, that's around the, the health dynamics, that we can't just be eating the same thing. You need sort of protein and micronutrients and calories um, all together. And there's the cultural component to that too, that if sort of I've never seen a bowl of rice before, I can't be sort of forced force-fed rice to meet my calorific demands. That's not quite um, sort of meeting food security needs. And the reason that we've moved into this food systems approach is to go from understanding food security as what happens on the farm and fundamentally about agricultural production. And that was sort of a, a legacy from the 1980s where everyone was, oh, food security, if we just produce more automatically, we'll have food secure, food secure nations to actually understanding more of the complexity of the food system that I've tried to highlight in those diagrams where you talk about the storage, sort of what you get from your local Woolworths and kind of how that gets to your shelves, to how people are accessing food from informal markets. And then this is an interesting diagram from a, a photo from the Eat Forum with two of um, the world's uh, best nutritionists. And we were having dinner and one of them was ordering sort of very expensive uh, asparagus and the other one sort of a burger and fries and it was like uh, I'm definitely going to hold this against you let me take a photo so that I can uh, <laughs> expose you the next time round. Um, so this is, this is what we mean there's sort of the preferences that the choices that we make around food everyone eats we're all a consumer of food and so it kind of links us in this very real way. And so coming to the South African food system, um, this is the, the front cover of the research document that I put together. As you can see it came from the Southern Africa Food Lab, which is based at Stellenbosch. Um, you can access it there through the WWF site. If you really just plug in the future of South Africa's food system in my name, it should come up. And I'm just going to give you some key numbers, facts um, that emerge from that report. Feel free to go and download it and read it in more depth yourself. Um, and just a few insights that we got from, from pulling this together. So when we talk about hunger in South Africa, um, less than 50% of the population is actually what we term food secure. Um, those who experience hunger are mainly in the urban informal sector, but also in the rural formal sector. Um, it's racially manifested, it is a legacy of apartheid. Highest prevalence of food insecurity is amongst the black population, followed by the colored and then the Indian population. So these are not, not surprising um, statistics, but it's sort of, sort of very real when you put, put numbers on it. Um, down at the bottom, you just see um, 
I should find my, my blog, but here you've got 26 experience hunger of the population, 28% um, are at risk of hunger, and then you talk about the 45.6 that are actually food secure. And then this is by province, um, experience of hunger. So um, Western Cape is the lowest, followed by Gauteng, and you can see the Eastern Cape has the highest prevalence of, um, of hunger. But hunger, absence of calories, absence of sort of satiation, feeling full, is not the only problem that we're facing in South Africa. I really like this quote that Luke Metlatam put into his, um, his analysis for Ernst & Young, saying that for South Africa, stuffed is fast becoming a bigger killer than starved. And he was referencing a book by Raj Patel called Stuffed and Starved in, in 2008. Where a child born in 2013 has a greater chance of suffering from the health impacts of having too much food rather than too little, right? And when we talk about too much food, we're talking purely around, around calories, not about micronutrients. And this is called the nutrition transition, and it's where human diets, our activity patterns, and nutritional status have undergone a sequence of major shifts over the past um, couple of decades that have changed how we use food and is re related to um, corresponding nutrition-related diseases, such as diabetes and heart conditions and all of those other non-communicable diseases that are, are highly related to, to food consumption. So in South Africa, a shift to westernized diets that are higher in salts and sugar and fats is replacing traditional diets. Um, it's having an impact on, on, on our nation's health. And you can see this phenomenon, it's not just in the US, it's actually occurring mainly in, um, in emerging economies like, like Mexico um, and, and South Africa in particular. And so some of the statistics there talks about how actually we have this hor horrendous statistic that about, um, just under, well, 25% of children in South Africa are actually stunted. stunted. And there are a high number that have micronutrient deficiencies, especially um, in, in vitamin A. Um, over 50% of women and 30% of men are actually overweight or obese. Uh, and th this information is coming from a 2013 study that was done by the um, Human Sciences Research Council, the HSRC, called the South African National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And the link is there, so you can go back and read, um, read more of the, the statistics on that. So it's not the kind of survey that you can do every couple of years. This was a very long, um, arduous process that they went through to get these numbers. But sort of the, the, these are the latest um, statistics that, that we have on that. And so we can talk about fast foods as, as, as a big culprit within this, um, that there's an increased consumption um, of fast food or convenience food um, obtained by, by takeaway vendors, generally en energy dense, low in micronutrients and fiber, and high in sort of simple salts and sugars. Um, 2009 study of teenage participants in Soweto showed that they consumed an average of seven or more of these meals per week, which actually yielded more than 50% of the daily energy requirements that they needed, but not the, the corresponding amount in micronutrients or the other essential um, nutrients that we need. And sort of the, the authors hypothesize that, um, you know, the fast food items that are very popular in South Africa, burgers, quotas, chips, fed cook, are actually going to become a regular part of the diet um, because they are also more affordable and then sort of um, they're, they're going to buy a salad from Woolworths, right? So you can also understand it's not just about the people's particular preferences, but it's a combination of access of, um, of eco economics and also of the taste preferences that sort of we've built up as, as a human species to want to crave salt, to want to crave energy tense, intense foods, but without having an active lifestyle that's actually going to, going to be spending that energy. And so, bringing a, a corporate lens onto this, just an example, the 10 largest food service companies in South Africa. This was a table that um, uh, Igombo et al. put together in 2012. Um, famous brands such as Wimpy and Debonair's um, pizza sit at the top. You then have KFC, followed by Nando's. This was just a general sense of kind of the, um, the share of the market that these different organizations have, so that there is also a, um, a, an analysis of the the companies and sort of the, the economic potential that you see within the sector, right? So it's not something that you can just regulate and stop overnight. There's definitely embedded and vested interests in maintaining the system. So that's the nutrition side. Moving more on to um, sort of the, the market, the, the numbers side. We talk about financialization of the food system. It's a combination of, um, of at the global level, trade and sort of futures markets, how people are starting to hedge bets against um, production. 
But in South Africa, it also has um, a very real um, result in how people are no longer growing most of their food, right? So you see trends in the majority of uh, the rest of the continent, uh, and I'll talk about that in the second lecture, where you still have a relatively high number of, of farmers. In South Africa, we don't. We have um, an increasing de -agrarianization. People are leaving the land. There, um, and this has been also a result of apartheid policies where a lot of um, men went to go work on the mines and sort of left women and children behind so that we haven't had a, a vibrant, small-scale agricultural uh, market for a while. Um, we have what we call a dual agrarian system, which is where we have sort of a lot of large-scale, um, generally white commercial farmers on one side and a lot of small subsistence farmers sort of working off more marginal land on, on the other side. And we rely very heavily on the commercial sector for most of our food production. Um, so you see the shift that people go uh, moving off the land. And then also a reliance on buying food. So even if you are in rural areas, you saw the statistic that actually um, there, there is still sort of food insecurity and hunger prevalence in, in rural areas, is that for your main staples, people are still buying their food because it's cheaper, right? It's, it's cheaper to be able to get your, um, your, your, your social grant at the end of the month or your paycheck to go and sort of buy, um, buy in bulk your, your maize meal or your flour or your rice. Um, and then to have a little garden on the side where you're getting your fresh produce, right? But to be able to produce sort of the calories required for an entire household when you can just buy it, you can understand that, that the labor-intensive aspect of that is, is just, not, just not feasible. So you have an increased reliance on purchasing the food, so that's a big component, and our and South African companies are very much bought into that. They're unable to sort of supply people across the country. Um, but then also, once again, you're seeing that the healthier versions of food are actually more expensive. So um, whole wheat versus white bread, a small study was done to show that it can actually, actually be between 10 to 60% more expensive to buy the whole wheat food. Um, and this is despite tax um, VAT ex exemptions for, for some key, key healthier commodities. Um, as I said, at the global level, um, South Africa has relatively open markets, um, and so international food price shocks, such as the one in 2007 and 8, can reverberate and, and, and translate directly to the consumers very, very quickly, and it doesn't get passed on onto the companies. And so we're also quite vulnerable to, um, to shocks that are happening elsewhere. So, for example, drought in or fires in, in Russia impact wheat pro uh, produce, and so our bread prices go up, for example. There are nutrition implications to this. Um, so the majority of households can't actually afford to meet their daily dietary requirements. Um, I'm going to show you what the, the food-based IT guidelines um, are. And for example, even though we've regulated um, maize meal, uh, if it's going to be sold in a shop, has to be fortified. Um, sort of that's compulsory. But even if you're consuming forti uh, fortified maize, um, sort of three servings through the day, you're only getting 45% of your recommended daily allowance of protein, 85% for iron, but 31% of vitamin A. So this is also not a, a substitute, let alone that people don't want to eat only <laughs> a portion of maize three times a day. Um, you're, you're still not getting the nutritional requirements from that. So food-based dietary guidelines, um, sort of very basic. I also just had this here for your reference. Enjoy a variety of food. Um, Sort of starchy food need to be part of most meals. Eat plenty of vegetables and fruit, but that fish, chicken, and lean meat or eggs can be eaten every day. It would be nice if we could sort of all afford to do all of this all of the day, but then the majority of South Africans um, really, really can't and sort of rely mainly on the starch component and increasingly on, on the fat or cooking oil component. And we'll come back to that when I talk about this phenomenon of, of hampers as a food security strategy. So hand in hand with this process, you have urbanization, a lot of people moving from rural areas into the cities for, for jobs, for access to all of the things that we, we enjoy here in the cities that you don't have in the rural areas. So now more than 60% of South Africa's population lives in urban areas. Um, there's also more than the equivalent of 1,700 supermarkets in South Africa. But I mean, this was a 2013 study, so the number's definitely gone up. Um, but even though they make up 2% of total retail outlets by number, they account for 50, 50 to 60% of market share, 
and a 97% of sales in the formal food sector. So this is a major component of how we all purchase our food, and I think everyone here can agree. I know I'm definitely culpable. This is where I get the majority of my food from. Um, ShopRite Checkers sort of sits at 38% as kind of the highest um, market share, followed by, not pink, sorry, pick and pay, um, spa, and then Woolworths has, has 8%. And they're also opening up a new format. Um, sort of, you'll see it in uh, petrol stations. I know when I lived in Cape Town for four years, the engine with the Woolworths on the corner of, of gardens was my standard go-to. And I, I work in the food system, right? But that was still definitely convenient. And um, I could get my salad as well as the other things that I wanted to. And so it worked. It was a strategy that definitely worked for me. Um, and so the expansion and success of these convenience store models has actually um, increased our reliance on them. Um, but we therefore just don't spend as much time, um, we don't dedicate as much time to buying food, to preparing food, to, um, to the even eating food, right? It's sort of this very quick, um, quick lifestyle. Uh, and other, other components have taken, uh, have taken um, uh, we've put in, we, we spend more time at work, we spend more time traveling, we spend more time doing other things. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a reflection of how our food system has shifted to kind of meet these, these alternative roles that we're taking on. So there's an interesting relationship between formal and informal markets. Um, supermarkets have become the major competitor um, for sort of local, more small scale, um, small and medium enterprises and agricultural um, ent enterprises. Um, to a certain extent, dis displacing them. But actually, you, you start to see that there's a bit of a complementary role that's paid. Um, so informal trading is still very much uh, part and parcel of, um, of fresh produce. Um, so people will buy sort of their large-scale heavy bulk items from the supermarket, but their day-to-day -day items um, sort of like fresh, fresh produce from, from, from spazas, um, because informal vendors are actually um, sometimes sitting outside um, supermarkets, and so there's a complementary aspect there. But they're also easier to find, right? You don't have to go to... Um, and you don't have the transport costs associated with, with trying to access supermarkets. It was an interesting study done by Jane Battersby here at UCT on actually access to supermarkets and how um, even though they were present in uh, informal settlements, for example, they're still really difficult to get to. They're not on every street corner as they are in the city bowl um, and, and the southern suburbs. Um, so that's also a reflection of this access component of where people are actually able to go out and buy, um, buy, their, buy their food. And there's also a, a reflection of, because of the strategy, you see a lot less healthier fresh produce being sold in supermarkets that are informal settlements, because they know people are going to be sort of bulk buying their, their processed and packaged goods. Um, rather than their, their fresh produce, and so they automatically start bending, responding to that need, and don't offer the healthier, um, the healthier options, and so it becomes a self-replicate, self-reinforcing um, process. So, some of the food security strategies that people then um, start to employ. So, food access is limited fundamentally by money, people's income. Um, by the time, if you're spending most of your time actually on transport from sort of an informal settlement into work and back again, I mean, that's, that's a large amount of time that you can't dedicate to buying or preparing food. Um, transport costs of being actually having to, to move all this food around. Electricity, you need, if you're going to keep fresh produce um, for more than a day, you need to have access to a fridge and electricity for that. You also need to be able to have access to, to energy of some sort to be able to cook the food right over time. And so this is why you actu actually see people um, having much faster food to be cooked, such as rice and pasta, um, because it, it can be cooked much more quickly than, for example, um, taking maize or papo, especially um, sort of the old brands, um, which would take a lot more time and effort um, to, to cook. So some of the strategies that people use, stock bills, kind of these savings organizations where um, groups will pull their money for, for big spends and be able to um, reap the benefits of bulk buying discounts. So there are a lot of female stock bills um, where, where women can actually put their money together. Um, this phenomenon of, of hampers where people sort of buy a set of packaged foods in bulk at the beginning of the month uh, or at the end of the month as soon as they get um, social security or, um, or their... Uh, or their income paid in. Um, you'll buy your fresh produce from the guy close to home rather than actually having to, to transport 
to transport it every day or, or store it overnight. Uh, and you're going to be buying foods that are sort of faster to, to cook. And there was a really interesting interview I did with the a lady in the Eastern Cape who said, all the, these young kids these days, they want to sort of buy food faster, to cook it faster, to die faster. She had this really interesting kind of relationship between the, these strange rice kernels that run around in my mouth. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> she was sort of very used to, very used to sort of pump and maize. And she was this, um, yeah, just reflecting on this complete uh, generational shift that had happened in terms of like what people were actually now even starting to eat in the extremely rural areas of, of the Eastern Cape. So packaged food company shares. We're sitting there with Tiger Brand sitting straight at the top. Unilever, Parmalat. So once again, there's a lot of companies are in this area, in this space, and they're they're capitalizing as as they they, they need to, uh, creating profit from from a system of um, from a food system that we um, continue continuously perpetuating, but which is not necessarily having the the health and sustainability outcomes that we necessarily want from from a food system. Um, Hampers, this was a study that my, my master's student did uh, in the Western Cape in July this year. And just to say that as a, as a strategy, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what hampers are, but you can see them sitting at the bottom here. They're basically combinations of generally um, cake flour, maize meal, sugar, um, sort of in, in really large quantities. And sometimes there'll also be some cooking oil rice thrown in and other kinds of essential packaged goods that you don't require a fridge for, right? So you can bulk buy at the beginning of every month. Um, and and uh, a lot of uh, spaza shops, these are from, from spaza shops, but also formal retailers will actually have them kind of prepackaged and generally at a discounted price because of the combination um, of goods together. If you actually go and do some of the numbers, it's not always a discounted price. Sometimes it can actually be more expensive, but you sort of there's this reliance um, on good faith that you are actually able to get this at a at a discounted price. And you can see that as a strategy, the dark um, uh, the dark green and dark blue is um, is showing the the percentage of households that were actually using hampers. Uh, so it's a pretty big, pretty large strategy um, for, for all of those households. And you can also see what the shelves look like in, um, in a lot of the, the retailers. Uh, this was in Philippi and, um, and Kai Licha, is that people are also quite brand loyal. So you can see that there was sort of Sasko, cake flour that no one wanted, but in the middle. I can't remember which one it was but it's sort of completely flown off the shelves, even though it was exactly the same price. So there, these are the really interesting trends that we have as, um, as humans, where we're loyal to particular brands, um, <laughs> that we have like, sometimes what we wouldn't call extremely rational decisions on, on the food that we purchase. And this is another aspect of the food system that we need to take into account when we're doing um, an analysis of it. So if you see over here, these are the different flower brands, and you can see the percentage of those, uh, of those brands that are um, in each of the, uh, the hampers. So um, if you can't read it, don't, don't worry. You've got flour, maize, rice, sugar, and oil. Sasko is the biggest percentage of, um, of flower brands that, that were, were found in hampers with a sort of smaller percentage of, of the rest. You have White Star is definitely the most popular um, maize meal brand. Um, H was only 7% of the ones that were found in hampers. Um, rice Speco in the Western Cape is a popular one. I think it's actually fantastic in Kuzulu Natal. So you even see provincial differences in, in people's preferences. Um, and then just the legend, the colors of the different um, groups. Uh, so Pioneer Foods is definitely the one with the highest amount of their products to be found in hampers, um, less so, for example, for Premier Foods and Tiger Brands. So this is just a general sense of um, the kind of items that you'll find in these hampers, um, and also the, the companies that are um, sort of a part and parcel of, of this process. So moving on to environmental factors, and as I said, this is where I am. Um, most of my research has actually taken place. Um, 
we live in South Africa. We all know it's a semi-arid country in sort of most instances. So water is probably one of the, the scarcest resources that, that we actually have. I think Cape Town, I was here during the drought. I think everyone is still, still recovering from and sort of recognizing how important water really is um, to, to our, our survival uh, in the country. Um, from an agricultural perspective, access to sufficient water on an annual basis um, is quite a significant challenge. And that's because we are drought prone in South Africa. That's sort of without taking climate change into account. Um, the also, the availability of natural water resources um, is a constraint on production because more than 60% of surface flows actually only come from 20% of the land in South Africa. And so we have a disproportionate amount of, um, of water accessibility. And that's why you see sort of large scale projects like the Lesotho uh, Highlands Water Project pumping all of the water into Johannesburg, right? It's sort of that large scale um, technological shifts of water in order to be able to, to meet different needs. Um, the agricultural sector already consumes about 60% of the total re water resources in the country. And this is despite only 10% of farmers actually having access to irrigation. Um, so this is quite a quite an interesting statistic that we, we use a lot of our water for our agricultural production. Um, and that's, um, and it's our large commercial farmers that we rely on for staples like maize, like wheat, that, that are taking up a lot, of, a, lot of this, um, a lot of this water. Most of your smaller subsistence and small scale farmers will be relying on, uh, on rain fed water. Um, rain fed agriculture, not water. Climate change. Um, this is always the, the, big, um, the big trend or, or, or impact that we talk about in the food system. Um, the biggest impact of climate change in agriculture in South Africa is going to be on change in rainfall intensity and distribution. So basically, if you take a map of South Africa, and I was trying to find a good one that didn't have a lot of... Uh, um, that I didn't have to cite 20 different things. But in essence, if you look at South Africa, we're dry in the, um, in the west, in the, in the southwest in particular. We get increasingly wet towards the east, towards the, towards the Indian Ocean side. So you're seeing sort of Mpumalanga and KZN have it being generally quite wet. Obviously, the Karoo, Northern Cape, pretty dry. And these trends are just going to get worse under climate change. So you're going to have more water, sort of more intense rainfall happening in the east, and even less happening in the west. So those are um, sort of, that's the, the biggest trend um, for projected climate change impacts in South Africa. And then there's also um, sort of the well-known idea of an increase in um, extreme events like droughts and floods, which is sort of largely um, related to, to these projections. Um, there's also the problem of temperatures going up and exceeding the, the sort of natural tolerance of, of, some, of some crops. So especially, for example, wheat is um, it's not a tropical crop. It's, it's sort of um, needs to sit within a very uh, precise level of, of temperature. If it exceeds the number of hot days for a certain amount of time, that plant will die. Uh, and under increased climate change, increased temperatures, that could also be a problem that our, that our crops face. So um, there's largely a negative impact of climate change on key cereal crops, specifically on maize in the summer rainfall area and wheat in winter rainfall. That's where we, uh, we plant most of our, um, most of our crops. Um, no substantive losses for sugarcane, actually. So um, that's one thing. We'll be able to have a lot of sugar. Not that we need any more sugar, but um, that would be one industry that, and the current projections, is not expected to, to face great um, shifts. Um, some of the financial losses, for example, if we put some numbers onto this, um, in one case study, losses from maize production could vary between 46 million rand, um, and that is if you have what we call the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. So that's if you're able to get higher yields from having more carbon dioxide in the air, because you know plants take in carbon dioxide to grow. So there is some kind of an effect. Um, so 46 million, but if you have no carbon dioxide effect, so if you have no yield improvements from the um, ex excess amount of carbon dioxide in the air, this could go up to 681 million rand loss per annum. So this is a substantial amount, not just from 
our ability to access food, to access maize, but also the, the, the profitability, the, um, the economics um, underlying it. Switching over to fisheries, this is obviously in, in the case something that's of, of uh, extreme concern uh, and relevance here. 2011 study by WWF just sort of outline um, very, very quickly the, um, the percentage of collapsed commercial line fish. So you can see that includes with, in the year they collapsed, so silver carp in 1999, carpenter, red stunt nose, red steel Roman. Um, so those are collapsed fisheries where we just can't reasonably actually get any of those, those fish anymore. Overexploited yellow belly rock cod of um, smooth hound shark. Um, white stump nose is still being reviewed. It's actually quite difficult to get numbers on fisheries um, collapse because sort of your ability to actually measure the exact number of fish um, is, we're, we're pretty good at it, but we're still not 100% precise. Um, but where you have in what they call optimally exploited, um, snook, yellowtail, thankfully, so feel free to, to have those. We've, we've managed to, to get that to a level of exploitation where where they, it is sustainable. Um, the more general marine resources, unknown status, um, for example, the gullus sole, the white mussel, um, Atlantic yellowfin tuna, um, underexploited, uh, herring and seaweed, so that's great, we can have as much of that as we want. Um, optimally exploited, we've managed to sort of work out yellowtail, hake, oysters, sardines, squid, you can read all of the numbers there. Um, Overexploited deep water hake, so when we sort of generally see hake in the, in the supermarkets, we should um, be working out whether it's um, shallow water or deep water hake. Um, rock lobster, as we all know. Um, Indian ocean yellowfin tuna, so there's also differentiation in the tuna um, between bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna. Um, the, the one that you can have is the Atlantic yellowfin tuna. And thankfully, WWF has come up with a, um, an app, the SASI app, S-A-S-S-I, where you can actually um, look up and see whether your, um, the fish that you're about to order is, is actually sustainably produced or not. So that information is, is readily available and it can be a, a simple way for us to actually start um, working around these, these, these fishery problems that we're seeing because fish is actually seen as a much healthier um, meat, right? Transition meat away from um, sort of red meat. Uh, um, e eating fish will get you a lot of the, the micronutrients, uh, omega-3s, three uh, for example, that you're unable to access from a lot of other foods. But the problem is if we're already exploiting now with an increased consumption, you're going to start to see problems there. So we have shifted a bit into aquaculture, which is being able to produce um, fish on, well, on land or also on sort of very agri um, uh, cordoned off parts of, of the ocean. Um, Integrated aquaculture has become, uh, has become a, a new trend over the past decade or so where you're actually able to, for example, have multiple different trophic levels. So you can sort of feed the detritus of some of your, your higher feeders into seaweed, for example, or mussels, and that can clean the water. So you actually have a circular system working through. Um, but it is more expensive and more extensive to set up, so not everyone um, actually does agriculture that way. So it is, it is shifting in, in di into different directions, but we can also talk about that more in the, the second lecture when I talk about solutions or potential intervention points in the food system. Um, and then finally, food waste. This is something that we don't often talk about, but it's becoming increasingly on the radar. So five, ten years ago, you wouldn't have seen food waste necessarily in a food systems lecture. It's now definitely there. Difficult to quantify, difficult to get numbers on, um, but there is a group at the CSIR that has done a study um, for South Africa. And, and, and basically the numbers are quite fascinating. So if you're looking at um, household food waste alone, about 21.7 billion rand wasted per year, which is just under 1% of GDP, but it's still a pretty big amount. Um, and this is even more interesting when you see that household food waste actually accounts for less than 4% of the total amount of waste in the system. So if you were to look at waste across the entire food value chain, um, this is going up to about um, 62 billion rand. Um, and many of this uh, occurs at the processing and distribution stages. 
um, of the fruit and vegetable chain. So that's kind of where you're seeing a lot of, a lot of losses there. Um, in the second lecture, I'll also talk about sort of more global trends around food loss and where um, you're starting to see some of the waste happening in, in different stages of the food chain. Um, and then another latest result um, that they showed when they say latest, it was 2013, um, about 177 kilograms per person per year um, of food is wasted across the value chain. 7% um, of that is happening after household, sort of what we're throwing into our, into our garbage. Um, so just I interesting numbers around, yeah. So um, a lot of it will happen um, where vegetables, for example, don't meet retailer requirements. So you have uh, a cucumber, instead of being sort of straight and long and easy to pack, comes at an angle so you can throw it out. So there's a lot of on-farm waste happening there. You also have, uh, once you've processed aspects of it, um, bits that, are, um, that, that can go off in, in the value chain. Um, actually need to go a little bit more in-depth into that, that aspect of it. I know in the, um, in the meat value chain, a lot of meat we just don't eat, there isn't a market for within a cow, and so that kind of just, some of it will go into um, pet food, for example, but some of it also is just, is just wasted. I know that the majority for fruit and veg is um, either food going off before it can get to market, so it's a storage concern, or it just doesn't meet um, the very precise um, requirements of, um, of the, the retailers. Um, so that's, it's, 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 quite, it's quite uncanny. The other um, aspect of that, and I think it's still incorporated in this, is our best before and sell by dates, where um, retailers are actually, um, they, even though the food could still be good, because it's got a best before date, they can't still have it on their shelves. And so that has to go off. So you'll actually see, um, particularly in the UK, I had a lot of friends who did what they call dumpster diving outside of big um, supermarkets because actually you'd, you'd see sort of kilos and kilos of hummus, for example, that had gone past its best before date but was still completely edible. And so it had to be thrown out, but you could still go and, go and access that. In South Africa, there have been um, some moves to, and also in the US, around food banks, being able to actually give some of the, that leftover food to, to food banks and be able to redistribute it that way. But the big problem, um, particularly in Europe, less so in South Africa, is that um, companies aren't, aren't really willing to do that because they don't want to be sued, right? If there is something wrong with that food because it was the day after or something like that, um, they can actually be held to account. And they're like, well, we'd rather just throw it out than have a big sort of lawsuit. So while you're incorporating it in the food system, um, environmental changes, is this <coughs> is food recycling also an aspect now that is coming in? Because so much food is waste. I know in America we throw so much. Yeah, so less um, food recycling, but more redistribution. Um, so, sort of, as I was saying, to food banks and, the, and those kinds of areas, um, but less. Um, so, so composting is that sort of what you were so thinking? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think it's it's a really interesting um, gap in our current in our current knowledge because very few studies have actually been done on that in particular. We've still been trying to get our heads around just trying to measure how much food waste does happen in the first instance. Um, so there's been be more work done on the barriers to being able to do that. But there are, um, are especially in Europe, um, apps, for example, where you can say, I've got left over this and I don't need it, and people you're able to redistribute within your neighborhood. Um, some fridges that have just been kind of put out on, um, on street corners where you can go and leave produce and people can just come and get it. So there are very local neighborhood kind of examples of that, that recycling happening. Um, but it's not within formal chains as far as I know. And, and very little in South Africa, actually. Um, yeah. Yes.
No, for sure. And the problem is the, the competition in that, is that we've become, as consumers, so used to going into our Woolworths and having avocados there um, from wherever they're able to source them all year round. So South Africa still has a little bit of seasonality in the kind of fresh produce that we have. Um, at least it's definitely reflected in prices. I know my mom always comes back complaining about the price of an avocado. I'm like, it's out of season, mom, just don't buy it. Um, but in Europe in particular, where it's just understood that you will be able to have bananas and pawpaw and avocado and all of these sort of very tropical um, fruits available on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if one particular retailer starts to, um, to say, actually, no, this is unsustainable and we can only provide you with the following when it's in season, when we have stock, when we run out, that's fine. They're going to go to the competitor down the road who is still actually offering them. And so this is why retailers are reluctant to make that shift now that they've actually started to, um, to, to fulfill our every need. If we can afford it, we then kind of expect it to be there. But it is a discussion that, that's ongoing. Um, it's just interesting to see how we've been locked in to this idea of being able to find everything we want on the shelf from everywhere in the world all of the time. Um, and this is the this, this, this supermarket um, uh, trend, right? That you can get all that you need from a very look, from one specific place. You don't need to go to your baker and then go to your butcher and then sort of find time to go to your local market on a Saturday. And you can get everything that you want all in one place. It's a convenient aspect. And we've become, I mean, I know I'm very complicit in that. I try my best to sort of get um, most of my produce from, from different kind of, um, at least from a butcher, for example. But also, when I'm running out of time, I just go into Woolies and get my pre-packed, very nicely cut up chicken strips. Um, you know, so, so that, that convenient aspect uh, is, is really important. And I think the other thing is, um, we were talking about South Africans not, um, so a large proportion of, um, of, uh, of, of poor South Africans spending a, around 40% of the income on, on food. But then there's also those of us sitting in the top 10, 20% of income earners spending a ridiculously low amount of our income on food. And, not, and in the States, you actually see less than 10%, I think, of, of income spent on food because it is, has just become so cheap that we're not actually, um, well, to, not, not, not that we're not willing, but we're not actually pulling out the money to, to affect the rest of the, the, the value chain, right? So we're, we're, we're buying into a system that is about sort of smaller margins. And so we are able retailers are able to throw out their hummus because it's so cheap in the production chain to actually grow it and make it that that's not actually hitting their bottom line. You'd think that these numbers would actually be hitting the bottom line of, um, of a, a corporate entity, but clearly it's not because this is happening. And a lot of those costs are actually passed onto farmers and at the farm gate, uh, and they're actually starting to suffer. Um, there's, a, there's a slide that I have in the second presentation which just shows sort of how, how narrow we took it, the, the hourglass figure of a lot of farmers, really, really small amount of retailers and, and distributors that are able to control most of the market and then all of us being consumers at the other end of the hourglass. So they're interesting, um, really potential intervention points where you could have a very systemic change in, in the sustainability of the system, but also a lot of, of lock-ins that are preventing us from actually making those, those kind of changes. Um, so this is a really interesting area too, and a lot more research needs to be done, specifically in um, developing country context, because most of the work is actually focused on um, on on farm losses, so not being able to to store food or sort of loss from from other kinds of events. Um, so this is perfect timing because we're just going into future trends to watch in the South African food system. So having done this research, um, came out as things that are going to are likely to, to continue to be exacerbated in, into the future. Not necessarily good or bad, just trends that are happening. 
So um, increased urbanization, more of us are likely to be in, in city centers and urban areas, and with that a shift to buying more food in a supermarket rather than growing it at home. Um, so how do we start to, with this trend, how do we start to think about sustainability and equity in the food system? Um, and that's the duality of the current agricultural system, where large commercial farms produce mainly for the formal value chain and smallholders are marginalized. This is a general trend, land reform bill trying to shift that. Um, but depending on how that plays out, this trend is going to be um, something very, very clear to watch. You can definitely do land reform in a right way that's going to be able to, to meet equity issues and still maintain food security. Um, and I think there are a lot of concerns in general around how this is actually going to be implemented. But um, sort of personal, sort of academic opinion on this is that it's been a level of uncertainty in the policy field um, around food for the past 20 years. And that finally actually getting some understanding of what direction it's going is going to be good for everyone, um, irrespective. Um, concentration of power. And some of those key players are sort of, I gave you a list of the, the key corporates that are in charge of um, sort of the fast food and the packaged food industry and the retail, and um, that this, um, this concentration and kind of the role that they play on, uh, on consumer choice is an interesting trend that, that's happening into the future. But you are seeing some pushback. So you are actually seeing, um, for example, in the Western Cape, and again, I'll talk about this in the second lecture, um, a lot of, of people actually responding to this and not wanting to be caught up in kind of that um, that commercial uh, aspect of the food system and who are trying to find their, their local producers or their local coffee shop who sort of sources directly from the farm that they know, for example. Um, but there is definitely a cost attached to that, right? So there's an equity aspect of who is actually able to access this, um, this more diverse food system. Um, ongoing nutrition transition and the impact on health, especially over the long term, so, so health over the long term in terms of non-communicable diseases, but also on our education system, um, if you're unable to get the first thousand days worth of a child's nutrition at, at sufficient levels, they're going to be, um, they're going to have difficulties for the rest of their lives due to that. And we're going to see the legacy of um, undernourished um, children in South Africa going on into the future, which is something that you, you can't retrospectively um, fix like that. It's something embedded within the system. And, and this is a, a, a great, great concern um, because it crosses across so many different aspects of, of the future of the country. Um, so that's that long-term impact of nutritional deficiencies in children um, is going to be, it's going to be something that, that we really need to deal with um, and need to, to stop happening at, at source. As a middle-income country, the kind of levels of stunting that we're seeing just really should not be, should not be there. Um, South Africa is always going to have a scarcity of arable land and water, and dealing with that is always going to be um, a trend that we need to watch, um, particularly as it says here with the impacts of climate change added on top of that. Um, depletion of fishery stocks, um, also the governance of fishing rights, who gets to fish in our waters and, and where those rights are allocated, Commun community fishes versus sort of large scale, bigger um, fishing vessels, big policy questions there. And then again, this waste, sort of the causes of it, but also the volumes of food waste and where in the system you can have some of the biggest impact is, is an ongoing trend that, that's going to be happening. Um, I'm now going to play a short video that the Southern African Food Lab put together around um, transformative scenarios for the future of the South African food system. Um, it explains most of it uh, in, in the video. I hope the sound works. Um, and we can discuss it and sort of talk more about questions and stuff after, after that. So, let me check. When it comes to the future of food in our nation, there's cause for concern. This prompted unlikely allies from across the food industry government, civil society, and academia to begin talking. The idea was to start looking forward to get their heads around different perspectives and work together as a collective of people from across the food system to could take action. They envisioned future scenarios about four make or break issues. Natural resources, 
production, political economy, and nutrition, and looked at how these might unfold in South Africa over the next 15 years. Imagine that 2018 represents the 10th year of unromantic candlelit dinners, thanks to the rolling blackouts. The rent continues to plummet while water costs rise. Continued energy insecurity means that farmers, particularly small scale farmers, take a big knock as their input costs surge. By 2019, almost half a million additional land claims have been launched, filling thousands of heads with dreams. But progress has come to a grinding halt. Frustration grows. With little education on nutrition, quantity of food is favored over quality. Most South Africans opt for cheap, tasty food that is low in nutrition and readily available. By 2020, land invasions escalate. They've moved from random occurrences to orchestrated events scripted for the camels. The result is fear in some and hope in others. Many commercial farms are abandoned, and the farmers angry. A Russian nuclear tender is successful and building starts in 2022. The cost of the bill go through the roof. Those concerned about food security worry that nuclear spending will take away from investment in water infrastructure, small scale farmer support, and social plants. By 2023, we are in the throes of a drought. Water restrictions are common. Those who can afford to invest in bubbles do so. Those who come, queue with budgets. Food prices increase, and more South Africans go to bed hungry. Education outcomes are suffering as teachers battle to teach hungry, unwell children. Hunger is the match that lights the fire, and there are threats of widespread violence, the outcomes of which may make my gunner look mild. Could it be that dire? Is this really what we're in for? The future is wide open. The worst of these crises can be averted. The thing is, the food system is not simple, and no other solutions to current challenges. The vital provision of food through the food system is not a linear process, but the contested outcome of a really complicated system. This calls for a response that isn't simple either. The response is one which will pull us out of our comfort zones. What if? Having thought about the future in this way, you, watching this now, gave some thought to what needs to be done. What if we actually started to communicate government departments, business, labor, NGOs, you and me, in such a way that we could think and act outside the box, looking at the bigger picture, acknowledging tensions, demonstrating teamwork, and creating courageous solutions together. Because it is together that we have the power. It is together that we can avert the moving crisis and deliver good food for all. So that's a video that I quite, I quite enjoy showing, especially after all of the doom and gloom. Sorry doom and gloom statistics that tends to come from an analysis of the, so the state of the South African food system um, right now. But there, there is hope. We're not sitting in a complete, completely chaotic um, system. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in, in the second lecture, these intervention and, and potential leverage points where we could intervene. Um, but I just wanted for the next... Uh, couple of minutes or so, five, ten minutes, open up for more questions or discussion or any other kinds of uh, issues that you want to, to talk about as, as a group.
Yeah. So I think um, it's interesting because my my paradigm and all of the work that that I do is about bottom up change um, rather than kind of top down uh, change. But this is all how how we see the world. There is no sort of right or wrong answer. It's just different perspectives. Um, but I've been working a lot in the Western Cape with um, a combination of of, of, of farmers, um, but also process of getting that produce through to through to through to us. So there are quite a lot of box schemes um, that you're able to sign up for that you can get. Um, you, you're not told exactly what it is that you get every week um, because it depends on what the farmers are able to produce. Um, but that challenged me almost even more than being able to go to the to the market because I thought. How much cabbage does one person really need per week? It sort of really forced me into, I need to process it, I need to sort of turn it into kimchi, there's only so much kimchi that you could have, can I just give it to someone else, you know? So it was that, that other side of it, and you can understand why we've become locked into this kind of supermarket system of being able to get the little bit of everything that I kind of need. Um, and so th there are some of those, we can sort of talk about some of those schemes, I'm sure people around here might also know of some of them. Um, but I've actually been seeing some interesting work with, um, with chefs happening. So we talk about South Africa, it's kind of, this is the gastronomic capital, Cape Town, Stellenbosch of South Africa. And so there's a lot of potential for being able to shift into higher quality produce, because that's what chefs are very interested in, um, because you're able to pay a premium price. And so a lot of the time um, you hear feedback from farmers is that, they're not growing what they, they could potentially grow because there's no market for it, or they can't do it at a, at a cost that's actually going to meet their, their requirements. And so they shift into whatever contract farming to the large scale um, sort of corporates are, are, are allowing them. But if you are able to get, for example, a market opening that will pay a premium price for some things, for example, within restaurants, we're already paying exorbitant amounts. We're almost sitting within a, a euro. European kind of context in terms of how much we pay in restaurants in, in, in the Cape, um, you're starting to be able to create a market where those farmers are able to sell their produce at a profitable rate. Um, so I'm working with a lady now um, who's established an NGO called Local Wild, which I'll reference a little bit in the next lecture, but she's actually been working with small scale farmers and in, in informal uh, settlements sort of around uh, peri-urban areas of, of the Western Cape, around indigenous foods. So when you think about indigenous food in the Western Cape, what do we think about? Snook, okay, yes, snook. Yeah. Yeah, there's fruits. But we don't really think about sort of June spinach and fainbos and other things that are around. We sort of sort of see those as ma maintaining dunes, but actually they can be really, really nutritious and really, really yummy and are a lot more um, resilient to the kind of crazy weather that we have in the Cape. Um, and so she's been working with some of these sort of small scale farmers to experiment with little patches of, of growing some indigenous food and being able to sell that to, um, to some of the, uh, the chefs that are, are looking to experiment and have more indigenous foods on their plate because foraging is sort of after Noma in Copenhagen um, kind of made it cool again. Um, <laughs> It's, it's unsustainable and something is, is protected as the fame boss, so you actually need to start cultivating some things. So there are some shifts like that happening, and I think as soon as you're seeing farmers being able to have a market, they will start shifting towards that. But I think that one of the biggest concerns that we have is that I also want to have a tomato that tastes like a tomato. Um, the problem is, is that I want tomatoes throughout the year. Right? I don't want to have just this one time when I can access a tomato. And so I think changing, being able to actually change our own preferences and being able to sort of say to supermarkets that as those of us around here who are the main um, consumers for your Woolworths, for example, to say that it's, it's actually okay if you don't have avocados on your shelves sometimes. I'm not going to stop buying from you and go to pick and pay to get it. Um, sort of that that change that we need to make um, to 50 years ago when it wouldn't have been expected to have all of those things, I think is one of the really important shifts. And, and, and so farmers will shift, but we also need to shift the consumer part of it. And it's small little leverage points or tweaks that need to happen that will have a, 
have a broader effect. But I think that there is still quite a lot of hope in the South African system because we haven't become as locked in as, for example, the US system is in the sort of much more corporate industrialized. We are still able to, to make some tweaks, also because we're very lucky in that we're, relatively speaking, a smaller country, but we're diverse enough to be able to get our avocados from Limpopo and our sort of pawpaws from KZN and our wheat from, from the Cape, you know, so we're actually really, really lucky from that perspective. Um, yeah. Comments, questions, yes. For sure. And having just so those that metrics. In, in longer, longer term, in, in global warming. 100%. Um, and just having that information available so that we can make those choices on our products would be useful. But then you see the flip side of it, and we look at our wine industry, which is fundamentally dependent on being able to export to a European market. You know, So it's, there, there's a catch-22 within that, but being able to pay more because of the carbon um, implicit within a production process, definitely. There's an interesting argument um, that Michael Pollan, who is a, uh, a food writer in, in California, um, also sort of a ver very famous in, in this food system debate, um, and he was actually criticized by a lot of um, uh, by, by uh, feminist and gendered writers um, because he was saying we need to go back to sort of cooking our own food, to having the knowledge around how to prepare a meal and pull different um, components together and actually cook ready and fresh, like a French housewife, for example. Um, and, and so a lot of people were saying, well, actually, you're blaming the shift in the food system on women entering the workplace and having jobs. Right, because that used to be the role. It would be mom at home, we'd sit and she'd cook the meal, and in France you'd go home at lunch for your main meal, right, and then go back into work, and that was her main role. And now that women are in the workplace, this is where you've seen sort of the um, corporates entering the space. You've got sort of ready-made meals, you've got all of these other things that are able to, to help process food um, much more easily. And so he said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. He said, everyone should have this knowledge to be able to cook food over time. And, uh, and I mean, I say yes, 100%, but once again, as I say, as someone who works in the food system, who does actually really like cooking, if and when I get, get time to do it, and if it, I also, as someone who lives on her own, um, would always would have to eat the same meal for the next five days, the kind of quantities that we're having to, um, having to buy in, in supermarkets, especially if I'm cooking something like otolenghi that's on average 20 ingredients per meal. Um, you know, so, so having that knowledge definitely is something that we need to put back to have importance, but there's, there, there are other constraints um, in that most households do need to have two incomes these days in order to be able to, to survive, to pay rent, to pay children's school fees, etc. Um, so it's not an interesting, um, as, as, as easy a shift to make. So just some of the debates, I'm not sitting on either side, just to throw them out there. Um, yes, ma'am, and then I'll come to you. That's definitely something that has been put up, and I think also 
something with that has been a combination with the school feeding programs that we have in schools in South Africa to actually have that paired with school gardens. So it's not just about preparing the food, but it's also understanding a carrot comes out of the soil, not sort of something that's in the supermarket that a sort of milk comes from a cow, which there's some scary American stories on how children sort of have been so distanced from the production system that they don't know that. And I actually work with, um, with a group of, um, of farmers in, in Kailicha who've been putting in some school, uh, some gardens in schools to help kids reconnect with the soil. Um, the, the, so, so yes, and actually on our, on our South African food policy is very good in this area. Implementation is a lot more difficult. I mean, we already see how shifting some of the curriculum is difficult, but, but I mean, yes, agree with you that that is um, as part of potentially the, the life skills that, that kids uh, need to learn within, um, within schools, that this whole nutrition cooking aspect is definitely a part of that. Just to throw um, something quickly into the side in terms of of actually <laughs> the scientific debate around nutrition and dietetics. Um, I mean, we know banting, for example, is, is a, a big trend that's sitting in the Western Cape. Um, the science behind what we actually need to eat and sort of the nutritional aspects as humans is, is also still quite highly debated. So the, the plates that we've seen, the food pyramids that sort of are, are passed around change in the US, depending on which lobby group is saying, no, we need to eat more dairy, no, we actually need to eat more, you know. Um, so there's a highly politicized, as well as a scientific uncertainty around sort of the, the science of, of nutrition. And there are some general rules around um, generally eat vegetables. <laughs> That's not going to be a problem. Cook things from the beginning. Don't eat highly processed fats, salty meals, etc. cetera. But, um, just, just to also say that I think we find ourselves in this situation um, also because with, the mar as, with all of the knowledge, I'm an expert in the food system. I still make really stupid food life choices around things. Um, one final question, and then we're going to do a break before I um, move on to the next lecture. For sure. So very good question. And I've been asking a lot of my modeling, sustainable diet modeling uh, colleagues to, to do some of those calculations because it is going to be different depending on where you are. So the Eastern Cape and KZN are going to be much more highly productive than, than your Northern Cape. So, but you'd be able to grow a lot more meat in the Northern Cape, obviously, your lamb, etc. Um, and so they're, they're going to be differences there. So I can't give you the exact number for South Africa. I think it's a really important question. And another one around if we were to divide the amount of production that we can have as South Africans, divide it equally amongst the population. What is it that we as consumers who can afford to buy more than our, than our share? And what is it that we should potentially be, be buying instead in terms of the meat consumption? It's not about not eating meat but about eating the right amount of meat from the right sources that have, have a lower environmental footprint. Um, but but a, a very good question, can't answer. I do know that households are able to, to survive off small garden plots of about, um, I mean, usually more than two hectares is required if they're going to be commercially viable, but you can have a small garden and, be, um, and, and have access to fresh produce, but then you're still going to have to buy in a lot of sort of your main staples, for example. So that's how most South Africans um, live, live today. But we can continue this discussion in the second lecture because it's going to be along similar things. I'm just being told I need to stop for now for a short break before we start again. Thank you. Thank you.
Jimmy. This is not the most intelligent outfit to wear for a mic. Is that okay? Yeah, in the back? Yes? Great. Um, so I'm going to jump straight back in again and hope that my voice can continue through the next, uh, I think we've got about 45 minutes um, left, but we'll, we'll see how long it takes for me to get through, to get through the slides. Um, so we started off, the first lecture was a lot on kind of the state of the South African food system right now. Um, and sort of started from this food systems approach to understand kind of the com complexity and uh, the fact that there, there are multiple different components, that it operates a lot around a lot of different scales and levels in the system. This is feeding back, I think. Um, I think that's better. Okay, if, if it starts doing strange things again, I'll, I'll make a plan. Um, and that also, there, there's a lot of diversity and nuance, and I think some of the questions that we saw from the floor were exactly alluding to that particular point, that we can't make these grand generalizations around the food system, around knowledge, around production, around how um, processes uh, of, of food production, retailing, processing, and consumption and waste happen. Um, and so it's, it's really fascinating working in this field, but similarly, I could go on for hours and hours to sort of talk about specific nuances on, on how, um, how we get the numbers or don't in particular instances. Um, the intersection across multiple different systems, so the food system is just, um, is just one component of kind of our, our global system. We have the water system which also impacts fundamentally from an agricultural perspective, but also from a sanitation perspective. And we know that health and nutritional outcomes are a combination of, um, of, of water, sanitation, and, and food consumption. You have um, the health system, which is another aspect. You've got both um, undernutrition, the malnutrition and stunting that we were talking about, but also obesity and the non-communicable diseases related to that. Um, around diabetes, for example, heart disease. You've also got food safety implications sitting within the food system. Um, we had the listeriosis outbreak last year that everyone is very, very familiar with in the room, I think. Um, you also then sort of get carcinogens, potential carcinogens, and sort of a feedback from the environmental process of pesticides and other inputs going onto, uh, onto our agricultural and farming systems that find their way either into water sources or um, as residues on the food that we eat, which also has further health implications. And so you could sort of go down multiple different pathways um, and discuss a lot of that. And, and we can talk about that more. I'll leave more time for questions afterwards. Um, but just to say this is the food system, it's either going to be the horrendogram, which is sort of the example of trying to talk about everything all of the time, or honing in on some interesting tidbits that we might be able to delve into a little bit further. But hopefully, I'm sort of ending off on the video around the future of the food system um, in the last lecture. There's a bit of a segue into this, um, into this lecture, but I'm going to take a, part, a, a step back and actually just give some information on South Africa in the contents of the continent of Africa that we find ourselves um, on. And so continent-wide trends in Africa, population increase doubling to 2.5 billion people by 2050, um, a very young population, so the demographics are really exciting. There's a lot of potential for a young population to have productive work. Um, urbanization, um, currently sitting at 40%, but expected to get um, to increase to 50% by 2030 alone, and some cities up to actually sort of 80, and some countries are up to 85%. I mean, South Africa is already sitting at 60% now. Um, so you can see uh, on the map, the, the red is the urbanization, sort of the, the city, city trends, a large amount happening around, or oh, population increase, sorry, um, West Africa in particular and East Africa kind of around, around the Great Lakes region. These are just some urbanization maps. You can see um, this is a shift over, over time um, in around Lake Victoria, uh, um, in the Gulf of Guinea, in Johannesburg area, everything going quite, quite red for almost the whole of Gauteng, and then around the Nile um, Delta in, in Cairo. So you can just see urbanization um, sort of being very visible uh, on the continent. Um, 
development trends from an environmental perspective. So this is work that was taken out of the Global Environment Outlook that we put together um, for you and environment uh, three years ago now, 2016. Um, but from an economic perspective, a lot of development trends. We're finding more oil and gas, as you know, on the continent. And this is something that we're, we're trying to capitalize on from, from economic perspective. The idea that actually um, transport corridors are going to be critical from, for development around the continent. So there, this is the um, African Development Bank's sort of major transport route and energy infrastructure development plans um, from, from 2012 being sort of going across the, the whole continent. Um, foreign direct investments, trying to attract it, not just into primary sectors like oil and gas and agriculture, but also into sort of secondary and tertiary sectors, um, and investment in infrastructure. So telecommunication, which is something that we've been leading on globally. As you all know, the mobile revolution in Africa was, was quite revolutionary. Um, but in terms of energy um, and even sort of agriculture infrastructure, roads, how critical those are to get sort of project produce to market on time and, and to maintain standards is, is critical. So this is just from a very general sense of on the continent, the kinds of trends um, that we're starting to see there. Climate change, we've spoken quite a bit about this. We've got a sort of a, a double burden in South Africa. We need to be looking a lot at mitigation, right? Sort of lowering the carbon intensity of, of our lifestyles, to be paying more if um, for, for food is traveling over many, many miles. Um, but actually, the majority of the continent um, is, is faced a lot less by mitigation. They have very low carbon footprints, but are going to be needing to adapt to the impacts of climate change that are already um, manifest in, in our system. So there's a lag effect. Even if we stop um, sort of producing any, any more carbon than we currently do, we're still going to see effects in the system over the next uh, 50 to 100 years. Um, so these are pretty negative trajectories. Double the global rate of temperature rise over the last five decades, so extremely hot temperatures. In the low mitigation scenario, which is kind of the trend that we're on now, especially um, with, with the US retreating and Brazil increasingly also going down, down that route with the, with the new uh, government, um, that you could actually see a four to six degree increase by 2100. Um, as I said, this is a, a negative scenario. Um, uncertain rainfall, we're pretty used to uncertain rainfall in South Africa, but even more uncertainty is not going to be very good for our farm or our production. And it's also going to impact our fisheries. So when we're talking about fisheries um, and the level of sustainability in, in our current um, offtake, this is going to actually um, also be impacted by, by climate because the ocean actually acts as, number one, a carbon sink, which is why we're seeing acidification and a breakdown of the coral reefs, but also um, it, it absorbs a lot more, more heat. So the ocean actually um, heats more readily than the land does, and so you see um, fish species being unable to, to exist within that, or shifting where um, they, they would normally be found to sort of further north into the Arctic and south to the Antarctic. Um, so you can see these are projections for fishery depletions, um, mainly around the, the tropical areas. So quick recap from, um, from the first lecture in terms of some of these trends and also that are, that are continuing on the continent. Urbanization. Um, the, the challenge that we have to deal with is that we need agriculture or production to feed cities um, where people aren't growing enough food for themselves in, in particular areas. They're not sort of living in rural areas anymore. The agrarianization, where it's no longer affordable or a good um, sort, of, sort of lifestyle strategy to, um, to be in agriculture, and so people are diversifying. Um, with that, there's also a loss of sort of traditional knowledge and diversity about how to grow um, in the conditions of the continent. So a lot of the commercial agriculture that we have follows a very Western-centric notion of kind of large-scale inputs, irrigation at size, when we're seeing under climate adaptation, um, actually you're going to need to shift to more um, agroecological production. So we've already uh, mentioned uh, about conservation agriculture, no-till agriculture being a shift in, in South Africa that sort of one step of, of many that we might actually need to be um, going along in terms of being able to grow um, more, more resiliently. So when you're actually diversifying 
all of your different foodstuff. You're not getting as high yields of everything, but you're able to actually maybe get two or three of your crops um, per season to be viable enough to grow. So um, a shift in the kind of knowledge and, and the diversity of the foods that we actually have. If you look at, um, I should have put the statistic in, but we consume, I think, um, of the hundreds of potentially edible species, we rely more than um, 60% 60, 60 on three, maize, wheat, and rice, yeah, as our major carbohydrates, uh, and sort of nine to 12 um, sort of uh, livestock species out of the, the multiple ones that we can have. So we have, with the intensification and uh, an increased efficiency in our agricultural system, we've lost the diversity that we might need to be able to, to cope with, uh, with the uncertainty of climate change and other environmental change processes. Um, again, with, within South Africa, but also on the continent, you have this dual agrarian system, large scale commercial farming that we rely on to feed our cities and sort of the smaller scale subsistence farms that tend to get left behind. Supermarkets, we call it McDonaldization, supermarketization. This is the increase in eating uh, fast food, but also access to, um, to, to supermarkets, and, and these is the main mechanism by which we, um, we access our food. It has improved our access to food in cities. Um, in, in most cities, you'll find a supermarket on, on most street corners. Food does tend to be cheaper, but the result of this is that it tends to be more highly reliant on highly processed foods that's high in sugar, fats, etc., as you saw from some of the previous slides. Um, and also lots of the knowledge and how to prepare our own foods from, from scratch. Um, nutrition transition, we've spoken about this, this double burden of both undernutrition as well as overnutrition, um, that you've got both hunger and obesity happening in the same households, micronutrient deficiencies across the board. Um, again, the stunting figure for South Africa um, is, is over 25%. Uh, it's increased, actually, from 2005, so we've had a negative, um, a negative shift. Obesity on the increase, and with that, non-communicable diseases. So as our lifestyles, you can call it westernized, you can call it modernized, change, um, and our diets become more aspirational. People don't want to be eating traditional food. They don't want to be eating what they call famine foods, for example, like cassava. Uh, I did some work on that in Nigeria. Um, uh, on the shift to cassava bread that they wanted to put in, and people said, I don't want cassava bread, I want wheat flour, even though it's imported at a ridiculous amount of money and cost to the Nigerian government's coffers. So KFC, white bread, are seen as status symbols. If you can afford them and provide for them, you're sort of making your way up within, um, within, uh, within the class. And so these, these sort of non-tangible aspects are extremely important to understand and work around when we talk about potential intervention points in the food system. So this was the, um, the diagram that I was mentioning, the hourglass figure. Um, so this is from 2008, the, again, the book Stuff and Style by Raj Patel that I, was, I referenced earlier. Um, this is just for, for Europe and then on the left in the United States on the right. But farmers, producers, suppliers, manufacturers, down to the smallest of buying desks, 110 buying desks with um, over 3 million farmers, 110 buying discs, and, and 160 million consumers. Um, United States, similar, slightly, slightly more in the middle, but globally this looks very, very similar, right, if you, if you look at the, the statistics there. Um, so actually, if you're thinking about intervention points in the system, if you wanted to tweak the fewest number of levers, you wouldn't be looking at consumption or at production, you'd be looking at the middle. But the arguments around the middle is that they're responding to what consumers want and that sort of produces a con and then passing it on to producers. So it's really interesting to think where does the actual power for change lie? Is it, the, is it in the numbers? Is it as consumers? Or are we constrained by what we're provided by? Does it sit around that middle where actually there's a fewest number of changes that need to be made, but they're sitting in very strict competition because of that? Or do we just pass it on to producers, on to the farmers themselves, and say, well, if you change, the whole system can sort it out. So questions, not saying what's, what's right or wrong or where it is. This is, this is an, ongoing, an, an, an ongoing debate. You, pro 
they need to look, work at all of them at the same time, right? Um, and so I've divided this talk. Yeah. Mm, yes, yes, exactly. Though we've got a smaller amount of farmers, relatively speaking, at, at the national level. But yes, we're sitting with a very small middle. Uh, yeah, like four or five kind of in the, in the center part. Um, I've divided the solutions into two different sections. The one is the conventional lecture that you would get, and the other one is the more, what, what, what some natural scientists might want to refer to as the airy-fairy, more human-centric side of things. Um, but I'm going to start with kind of the, the, the standard solutions that have been very well discussed in, in the literature. So how, how do we deal with all of these challenges? There's this idea of sustainable intensification, which is about increasing your yields, increasing your production, but on less land with fewer inputs. Sounds great. Um, some of these shifts that you can see here, the potential for increasing um, yields of, of some crops of, this is, um, I think, for, for maize. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure which crop that actually is. But for France, there's sort of a, a small amount that you can. USA, you could get a little bit more out because it's a bit more extensive. Similarly with Argentina. And then Kazakhstan is, is sort of a very big shift. African yields in general are very much below what they could be. There's a lot of potential for increasing, just on the same amount of land being able to increase the amount of food that you can get off it. Um, um, so this is not this is very conventional agriculture. This, so this is not permaculture. This is um, more precision agriculture. So if you look at um, at, the, at the next slide, so the um, food and agriculture and the CG systems climate smart agriculture is that you still have inputs, but you increase their efficiency, right? So you have precision agriculture. So you have very precise irrigation. You need to have irrigation. Africa relies mainly on rainfall. If you actually put in irrigation, you would get improved yields. But it needs to be precise. It can't just be sort of um, a, a lot of water um, put on. Similarly, with, with, uh, with fertilizers, there's an interesting graph. Um, as I'm going through this now, I'm thinking of all the other slides I could have put in. It's probably good that I didn't, but there's an interesting um, graph on the amount of fertilizer input um, in China over the past few years, and kind of the, the change in, in relative yields, or sort of yields have had a bit of a linear um, growth, but uh, fertilizer has had an exponential growth, so you're actually getting, there is a sweet spot where you can input more fertilizer and actually get a commensurate increase in, in yields. But at some point, you're just throwing a whole lot of nitrogen, and it's not really going anywhere. It's mainly going into your water system. Um, so precision is kind of the, the name of the game here. You can also look at carbon sequestration, so conservation agriculture, to sort of no-till to make sure that you're actually putting carbon into your soils and keeping it there. Um, agroforestry is sort of a diversification strategy where actually you're, you're locking a lot of that carbon into trees. You're only actually taking off, off the fruit, so you're not losing the carbon from, from the forests. Um, and then again, sort of waste reduction, um, being able to sort of cycle, for example, ruminant um, uh, organic fertilizer. Um, if you actually had a system where you can move that and then grow plants on, as most subsistence agricultural households would have. Um, you're able to then circle the wastes, both from, um, from livestock, but also from leftover bits and pieces of, of the maize that you don't actually eat most of it. You're sort of taking that off. If you till that back in, um, you're able to reduce your, your nitrogen requirements. Um, so that's sort of mitigation, sustainable intensification 101. Um, adaptation, right? So sort of not just looking at mitigating for, for climate, but also adapting to it. Um, you're going, you're going to have to look at more varied crops, so not just relying on the main ones that we've kind of got into a high level of efficiency. Um, stress tolerant varieties, so both of these are naturally occurring. For example, sorghum in, in southern Africa is a generally drought tolerant um, crop. We've completely diversified away from it. I'm doing a project on it now where we rely completely on maize uh, and sort of sorghum is just not necessarily um, a viable product for, for farmers uh, to, to grow at the moment. Um, though you are seeing a little bit of a, a, a resurgence happening in the, um, a lot of in, in the wellness market, for example, where sort of it's recognized for increased 
nutritional benefits. Um, so I was <laughs> interested to see that at Wellness Warehouse you can get sorghum, imported organic sorghum flour from India at about 40 rand a kilo. Um, but you could also get mabele from sort of some of your Limpopo or Free State farmers for a <laughs> very substantially reduced cost there, but people aren't quite quite making that connection. So there's there's an interesting shift around crop diversification and sort of how, how farmers are able to respond to the needs that they have to be more um, climate and environmentally resilient. But also they still need to have a market for their foods and our changes as consumers, our habits, um, don't shift quite, quite as readily. Um, novel food producing systems. Um, so we have everything from sort of hybridization and there's, there's a, a salmon that they've put um, that they've done a transgenic salmon in the US that's able to grow a lot faster in aquaculture, um, which, is, which is one way of upping our, our salmon increase. There's uh, laboratory meats, different kinds of like alternative meat sources, both vegetarian meat, but also lab-grown meat that is, is actually exponentially growing and, and is going to be, is, is already on, on our shelves uh, as we speak. Insect protein is another interesting shift that people are moving into. A um, lot of California, actually. Um, most of your um, sort of your weight proteins are actually insect-based at this point, which is really quite fascinating. Um, in South Africa, we have slightly less issues around eating insects. I'm not quite as few issues as Southeast Asia, but it's another interesting shift. What, what was happening, um, I was at a conference a couple of years ago where um, I think Stellenbosch was working on an integrated system where they were taking food waste growing larvae, feeding the larvae to pigs, and then eating the pigs. Um, and sort of that system was seeming to, to sort of be quite an interesting integrated system. Um, whereas in the Netherlands, they were trying to force people to eat the insects directly, and it wasn't being as, having as, as great a success. So interesting in these different angles that we take, but alternative, uh, alternative food um, products is definitely, is definitely up there. Preserving our biodiversity, um, sort of as we go through one of the the, the, the sixth mass extinction um, caused by by humans mainly, uh, but also as climate is going to have an impact on that. But we also recognise the importance of um, diverse uh, diverse foods and, and, and animals. Um, this is the Svalbard seed bank up in um, sort of the, the north of north of Norway. Um, so actually just preserving that diversity so that we, we have the potential locked up in those rooms for future use is an adaptation measure that, that some people have, have, um, have said is going to be very important in the long run. We can't work on all the things at the same time. So is that where the real tomato would be? The real tomato sitting in there somewhere, exactly. You need to go and find the right gene and bring it back out. <laughs> um, Improving food storage, so we've known that that's sort of an ongoing concern. Um, 15 to 25 percent of losses to pests and dampened store is also one of the areas of food waste that we can really get our heads around. Um, there's an interesting mantra around how we need to 